Babylon by A. G. Stevens. Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman. Babylon has fallen. Ay, but Babylon endures. Wherever human wisdom shines or human folly lures. Where lovers lingering walk beside and happy children play is Babylon, Babylon, for ever and for a. The plan is rudely fashioned, the dream is unfulfilled, yet all is in the archetype if but a builder willed. And Babylon is calling us, the microcosm of men to range her walls in harmony and lift her spires again. The sternest walls, the proudest spires, that ever sun shone on, halting a space his burning race to gaze on Babylon. Babylon has fallen. Ay, but Babylon shall stand. The mantle of her majesty is over sea and land. Hers is the name of challenge flung, a watchword in the fight. To grapple grim eternities, and gain the old delight. And in the word the dream is hid, and in the dream the deed, and in the deed the mastery, for those who dare to lead. Surely her day shall come again, surely her breed be born, to urge the hope of humankind and scale the peaks of morn, to fight as they who fought till death their bloody field upon, and kept the gate against the fate frowning on Babylon. Babylon. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Buried Life by Matthew Arnold. Read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Clett. Light flows our war of mocking words, and yet, behold, with tears mine eyes are wet, I feel a nameless sadness o'er me roll. Yes, yes, we know that we can jest, we know, we know that we can smile. But there's a something in this breast, to which thy light words bring no rest, and thy gay smiles no anodyne. Give me thy hand, and hush a while, and turn those limpid eyes on mine, and let me read there, love, thy inmost soul. Alas! Is even love too weak to unlock the heart and let it speak? Are even lovers powerless to reveal to one another what indeed they feel? I knew the mass of men concealed their thoughts, for fear that if revealed they would by other men be met with blank indifference, or with blame reproved. I knew they lived and moved, tricked in disguises, alien to the rest of men, and alien to themselves, and yet— the same heart beats in every human breast. But we, my love, doth a like spell benumb our hearts, our voices? Must we too be dumb? Ah, well for us, if even we, even for a moment, can get free our heart, and have our lips unchained, for that which seals them hath been deep ordained. Fate, which foresaw how frivolous a baby man would be, by what distractions he would be possessed, how he would pour himself in every strife, and well-nigh change his own identity, that it might keep him from his capricious play his genuine self, and force him to obey even in his own despite his being's law, bad through the deep recesses of our breast, the unregarded river of our life pursue with indiscernible flow its way, and that we should not see the buried stream, and seem to be eddying at large in blind uncertainty, though driving on with it eternally. But often, in the world's most crowded streets, but often in the din of strife, there rises an unspeakable desire, 
after the knowledge of our buried life, a thirst to spend our fire and restless force in tracking out our true original course, a longing to inquire into the mystery of this heart which beats so wild, so deep in us, to know whence our lives come and where they go. And many a man in his own breast then delves, but deep enough, alas, none ever minds. And we have been on many thousand lines, and we have shown on each spirit and power. But hardly have we, for one little hour, been on our own line, have we been ourselves, hardly had skill to utter one of all the nameless feelings that course through our breast, but they course on for ever unexpressed. And long we try in vain to speak and act our hidden self, and what we say and do is eloquent, is well, but tis not true. And then we will no more be racked with inward striving, and demand of all the thousand nothings of the hour their stupefying power. Ah, yes, and they benumb us at our call. Yet still, from time to time, vague and forlorn, from the soul's subterranean depth upborne, as from an infinitely distant land, come airs and floating echoes, and convey a melancholy into all our day. Only, but this is rare, when a beloved hand is laid in ours, when, jaded with the rush and glare of the interminable hours, our eyes can in another's eyes read clear, when our world-deafened ear is by the tones of a loved voice caressed, a bolt is shot back somewhere in our breast, and a lost pulse of feeling stirs again. The eye sinks inward, and the heart lies plain, and what we mean we say, and what we would we know. A man becomes aware of his life's flow, and hears its winding murmur, and he sees the meadows where it glides, the sun, the breeze. And there arrives a lull in the hot race wherein he doth for ever chase that flying and elusive shadow, rest. An air of coolness plays upon his face, and an unwonted calm pervades his breast. And then he thinks he knows the hills where his life rose, and the sea where it goes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Celia by Lola Ridge Read for LibriVox.org by Shona Brogdon Starble Cherry, cherry, glowing on the hearth, Bright red cherry. When you try to pick up cherry, Celia's shriek sticks in you like a pin. When God throws hailstones, you cuddle in Celia's shawl and press your feet on her belly high up like a stool. When Celia makes umbrell of her hand, rain falls through big pink spokes of her fingers. When wind blows Celia's gown up off her legs, she runs under pillars of the bank, great round pillars of the bank have on white stockings too. Celia says my father will bring me a golden bow. When I think of my father, I cannot see him for the big yellow bow like the moon with two handles he carries in front of him. Grandpa, Grandpa, light all about you, ginger pouring out of green jars. You don't believe he has gone away and left his great coat, so you pretend you see his face up in the ceiling. When you clap your hands and cry, Grandpa, 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 Celia crosses herself. It isn't a dream. It comes again and again. You hear Ivy crying on steeples, 
the flames haven't caught yet, and images screaming when they see red light on the lilies, on the stained glass window of St. Joseph. The girl with the black eyes holds you tight, and you run and run past the wild, wild towers, and trees in the gardens tugging at their feet, and little frightened dolls shut up in the shops, crying and crying because no one stops. You spin like a penny thrown out in the street. Then the man clutches her by the hair. He always clutches her by the hair. His eyes stick out like spears. You see her pull-back face and her black, black eyes lit up by the glare. Then everything goes out. Please, God, don't let me dream any more of the girl with the black, black eyes. Celia's shadow rocks and rocks, and Mama's eyes stare out of the pillow as though she had gone away and the night had come in her place as it comes in empty rooms. You can't bear it, the night threshing about and lashing its tail on its sides, as bold as a wolf that isn't afraid. And you scream at her face that is white as a stone on a grave and pull it around to the light till the night draws backward, the night that walks alone and goes away without end. Mama says, I am cold, Betty, and shivers. Celia tucks the quilt about her feet, but I run for my little red cloak because red is hot like fire. I wish Celia could see the sea climb up on the sky and slide off again. Celia saying, I'd beg the world with you. Celia, holding on to the cab, hands wrenched away, wind in the mass, like Celia crying. Celia never minded if you slapped her when the comb made your hairs ache, but though you rub your cheek against Mama's hand, she has not said darling since. Now I will slap her again. I will bite her hand till it bleeds. It is cool by the porthole. The wet rags of the wind flap in your face. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A description of a city shower by Jonathan Swift. Read for LibriVox.org by John Nixon, the supercargo of www.thesupercargo.com Careful observers may foretell the hour by sure prognostics when to dread a shower. While rain depends, the pensive cat gives o'er her frolics and pursues her tail no more. Returning home at night, you'll find the sink strike your offended sense with double stink. If you be wise, then go not far to dine. You spend in coach hire more than save in wine. A coming shower, your shooting corns presage, old aches throb, your hollow tooth will rage. Sauntering in coffee house is dull man seen. He damns the climate and complains of spleen. Meanwhile, the south rising with dabbled wings, A sable cloud athwart the welkin flings, That swilled more liquor than it could contain, And like a drunkard gives it up again. Brisk Susan whips her linen from the rope, While the first drizzling shower is born a slope, Such is that sprinkling which some careless queen Flirts on you from her mop, but not so clean. You fly, invoke the gods, then turning, stop to rail, she singing, still whirls on her mop. 
Not yet the dust had shunned the unequal strife, but aided by the wind fought still for life, and wafted with its foe by violent gust. T'was doubtful which was rain and which was dust. Ah, where must needy poet seek for aid when dust and rain at once his coat invade? Soul coat! where dust cemented by the rain erects the nape and leaves a cloudy state. Now in contiguous drops the flood comes down, threatening with deluge this devoted town. To shops in crowds the daggled females fly, pretend to cheapen goods, but nothing buy. The Templars spruce, while every spout's a brooch, stays till tis fair, yet seems to call a coach. The tucked-up seamstress walks with hasty strides, while streams run down her oiled umbrella's sides. Here various kinds, by various fortunes led, commence acquaintance underneath a shed. Triumphant Tories and desponding Whigs forget their feuds and join to save their wigs. Boxed in a chair, the bow impatient sits, while spouts run clattering o'er the roof by fits, and ever and anon with frightful din the leather sounds. He trembles from within. So, when Troy chairmen bore the wooden steed, pregnant with Greeks impatient to be freed, those bully Greeks, who as the moderns do, instead of paying chairmen, run them through, Leoken struck the outside with his spear, and each imprisoned hero quaked for fear. Now from all parts the swelling kennels flow, and bear their trophies with them as they go. Filth of all hues and odours seem to tell what streets they sailed from by the sight and smell. They, as each torrent drives with rapid force from Smithfield or St. Pulchre's shape their course, and in huge confluent join at Snow Hill Ridge, fall from the conduit prone to Hoban Bridge, sweepings from butcher's stalls, dung, guts, and blood, drowned puppies, stinking sprats all drenched in mud, dead cats, and turnips tops come tumbling down the flood. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Destruction of Sennacherib by Lord Byron Read for LibriVox.org by Lucy Perry The Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee like the leaves of the forest when summer is green that host with their banners at sunset were seen like the leaves of the forest when autumn hath blown the host on the morrow lay withered and strown for the angel of death spread his wings on the blast and breathed in the face of the foe as he passed and the eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly and chill and their hearts but once heaved and forever grew still and there lay the steed with his nostril all wide but through it there rolled not the breath of his pride and the foam of his gasping lay white on the turf and cold as the spray of the rock-beating surf and there lay the rider distorted and pale with the dew on his brow and the rust on his mail and the tents were all silent and the banners alone the lances unlifted the trumpets unblown and and the widows of Ashur are loud in their wail, and the idols are broke in the temple of Baal, and the might of the genteel, and smote by the sword, hath melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Election Day by Ambrose Bierce Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Campbell in Appleton, Wisconsin in 2009. Election Day Despots effete upon tottering thrones unsteadily poised upon dead men's bones. Walk up, walk up, the circus is free, and this wonderful spectacle you shall see. Millions of voters who mostly are fools, demagogues, dupes, and candidates tools armies of uniformed mountebanks and brain disciples of brainless cranks many a week they bellowed like beeves bitterly blackguarding lying like thieves libeling freely the quick and the dead and painting the new jerusalem red tyrants monarchical 
emperors, kings, princes, and nobles, and all such things. Noblemen, gentlemen, step this way. There's nothing the devil accepted to pay. And the freaks and curios here to be seen are very uncommonly grand and serene. No more with vivacity they debate, no cheerfully crack the illogical pate, no longer the dull understanding to aid, the stomach accepts the instructive blade, nor the stubborn heart learns what is what from a revelation of rabbit shot. And vilification's flame, behold, burn with a bickering faint and cold. Magnificent spectacle! Every tongue suddenly civil that yesterday rung, like a clapper beating a brazen bell, each fair reputation's eternal knell. Hands no longer deliver blows, and noses for counting arrayed in rows. Walk up, gentlemen, nothing to pay. The devil goes back to hell today. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Elegy number twenty to his mistress going to bed by John Donne. Read for LibriVox.org by Shulifa Mothergem. Come, madam, come, all rest my powers defy. Until I labour, I in labour lie. The foe of times, having the foe inside, is tied withstanding, so he never fight. Off with that girdle, like heaven's own glittering, but a far fairer world encompassing. And pin that spangled breastplate, which you wear, that sides of busy fools may be stopped there. Unlace yourself, for that harmonious chime tells me from you that now it is bedtime. Off with that happy busk, which I envy, that still can be, and still can stand so nigh. Your gown going off such beauteous state reveals, as when from flowery meads the hill's shadow steals. Off with your wary coronet, and show the hairy diadems which on you do grow. Off with your hose and shoes, then softly tread in this love's hallowed temple, this soft bed. In such white robes, heaven's angels used to be revealed to men. Thou, angel, bringst with thee a heaven-like mammoth's paradise. And though ill spirits walk in wide, we easily know by this these angels from an evil sprite. So said our hairs, but these our flesh are bright. License my roving hands, and let them go before, behind, between, above, below. O oh, my America, my new-found land, my kingdom safest when with one man mend, my mine of precious stones, my empery, how am I blessed in thus discovering thee? To enter in these bonds is to be free. Then, where my hand is set, my soul shall be. Full nakedness, all joys are due to thee. As souls unbodied, bodies unclothed must be to taste all joys. Gems which you women use are like Atlanta's ball cast in men's views, that when a fool's eye lighteth on a gem, his earthly soul might court that, not them. Like pictures, or like books, gay coverings, made for laymen, are all women thus arrayed. Themselves are only mystic books, which we, whom their imputed grace will dignify, must see revealed. Then, since that I may know, as liberty as to thy midwife, Show thyself. Cast all, yea, this white linen hence. There is no penance due to innocence. To teach thee, I am naked first. Why then, what needst thou have more covering than a man?
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Fisherman by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Shona Brockenstorble Although I can see him still, the freckled man who goes to a gray place on a hill in gray camomera clothes at dawn to cast his flies. It's long since I began to call up to the eyes this wise and simple man. All day I'd looked in the face what I had hoped would be to write for my own race and the reality, the living men that I hate, the dead man that I loved, the craven man in his seat, the insolent unreproved, and no knave brought to book who has won a drunken cheer, the witty man and his joke aimed at the commonest ear, the clever man who cries the catch cries of the clown, the beating down of the wise, and great art beaten down. Maybe a twelve months since suddenly I began, in scorn of this audience, imagining a man and his sun-freckled face and gray conomera cloth, climbing up to a place where stone is dark under froth, and the downturn of his wrist when the flies drop in the stream a man who does not exist, a man who is but a dream, and cried, Before I am old, I shall have written him one poem, maybe as cold and passionate as the dawn. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Garden by Andrew Marvell Read for LibriVox.org by Jason Mills How vainly men themselves amaze To win the palm, the oak, or bears, And their incessant labours see Crowned from some single herb or tree, Whose short and narrow verged shed Does prudently their toils upbraid. While all flowers and all trees do close To weave the garlands of repose. Fair quiet have I found thee here, And innocence thy sister dear. Mistaken long I sought you then In busy companies of men. Your sacred plants, if here below, Only among the plants will grow. Society is all but rude To this delicious solitude. No white, nor red was ever seen, So amorous as this lovely green. Fond lovers, cruel as their flame, Cut in these trees their mistress' name. Little, alas, they know or heed How far these beauties hers exceed. Fair trees, wheresoe'er your barks are wound, No name shall but your own be found. When we have run our passion's heat, Love hither makes his best retreat. The gods, that mortal beauty chase, Still in a tree did end their race. Apollo hunted Daphne so, Only that she might laurel grow, And Pan did after Syrinx speed, Not as a nymph, but for a reed. What wondrous life in this I lead! Ripe apples drop about my head, The luscious clusters of the vine Upon my mouth do crush their wine, The nectarine and curious peach Into my hands themselves do reach. Stumbling on melons as I pass, And snared with flowers, I fall on grass. Meanwhile the mind, from pleasure less, Withdraws into its happiness. The mind, that ocean where each kind Does straight its own resemblance find. Yet it creates, transcending these, Far other worlds and other seas, Annihilating all that's made, 
to a green thought in a green shade. Here at the fountain's sliding foot, or at some fruit tree's mossy root, casting the body's vest aside, my soul into the boughs does glide. There like a bird it sits and sings, then wets and combs its silver wings, and, till prepared for longer flight, waves in its plumes the various light. Such was that happy garden state, while man there walked without a mate. After a place so pure and sweet, what other help could yet be meet? But twas beyond a mortal's share to wander solitary there. Two paradises twere in one, to live in paradise alone. How well the skilful gardener drew, of flowers and herbs, this dial new. Where from above the milder sun does through a fragrant zodiac run. And as it works, the industrious bee computes its time as well as we. How could such sweet and wholesome hours be reckoned but with herbs and flowers? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. God's Grandeur by Gerard Manley Hopkins Read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Clett The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things, and though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning, at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with ah, bright wings. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Happy the Man by John Dryden Read for LibriVox.org by Lucy Perry Happy the man, and happy he alone, He who can call to-day his own, He who, secure within, can say, To-morrow do thy worst, for I have lived to-day. Be fair or foul, or rain or shine, The joys I have possessed in spite of fate are mine. Not heaven itself upon the past has power, But what has been, has been, and I have had my hour. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. He wishes for the cloths of heaven, by William Butler Yeats, read for LibriVox.org by Julie van Mulligan. Had I the heavens embroidered cloths and wrought with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and the half-light. I would spread the cloths under your feet, but I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Irish Airman Foresees His Death by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Jason Mills I know that I shall meet my fate Somewhere among the clouds above. Those that I fight I do not hate, Those that I guard I do not love. My country is Kiltartan Cross, My countrymen Kiltartan's poor, no likely end could bring them loss, Or leave them happier than before. Nor law, nor duty bade me fight, Nor public men, nor cheering crowds, A lonely impulse of delight, 
drove to this tumult in the clouds. I balanced all, brought all to mind. The years to come seemed waste of breath, a waste of breath the years behind, in balance with this life, this death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I stood tiptoe upon a little hill by John Keats, read for LibriVox.org by Sergio Baldelli. I stood tiptoe upon a little hill. The air was cooling and so very still that the sweet buds, which with the modest pride pulled droopingly in slanting curve aside, there scantily leaved and finely tapering stems had not yet lost those sturdy diadems caught from the early sobbing of the morn. The clouds were pure and white as the flocks new shorn, and fresh from the clear brook. Sweetly they slept on the blue fields of heaven, and then there crept a little noiseless noise among the leaves, born of the very sigh that silence heaves for not the faintest motion could be seen of all the shades that slanted o'er the green there was wider wandering for the greedy sty to peer about upon variety far round the horizon's crystal air to skim and to trace the dwindled edgings of its brim to picture out the quaint and a curious bending of a fresh woodland alley never ending or by the bowery clefts and leafy shelves guess where the jaunty streams refresh themselves i gazed a while and felt as light and free as though the fanning wings of a mercury had played upon my heels i was lighter-hearted and many pleasures to my vision started so i straightway began to pluck a posy of luxuries bright, milky, soft and rosy, a bush of May flowers with the bees about them, are sure no tasteful nook would be without them, and let a lush laburnum oversweep them, and let a long grass grow round the roots to keep them a moist, cool and green, and a shade the violets that they may bind the moss in leafy nets a filbert hedge with the wild briar overtwined and clumps of woodbine taking the soft wind upon their summer thrones there too should be the frequent checker of a youngling tree that with a score of light green brethren shoots from the quaint mossiness of aged roots around which is heard a spring ahead of a clear waters babbling so wildly of its lovely daughters the spreading bluebells it may haply mourn that such fair clusters should be rudely torn from their fresh beds and scattered thoughtlessly by infant hands left on the path to die Open afresh your round of starry folds, ye ardent marigolds. Dry up the moisture from your golden lids, for great Apollo bids that in these days your praises should be sung on many harps which he has lately strung. And when again your Junis he kisses, tell him I have you in my world of blisses. So haply, when I rove in some far vale, his mighty voice may come upon the gale. Here are sweet peas on tiptoe for a flight, with the wings of a gentle flush over delicate white, and a taper fingers catching at all things, to bind them all about with the tiny rings. Linger a while upon some bending planks that lean against the streamlet's rushy banks and watch intently nature's gentle doings they will be found softer than ring-doves cooings 
how silent comes the water round that bend not the minutest whisper does it send to the overhanging sallows blades of grass slowly cross the checkered shadows pass why you might read two sonnets ere they reach to where the hurrying freshness is a peach in nature's sermon o'er thy pebbly beds where swarms of minnows show their little heads staying their wavy bodies against the streams to taste the luxury of sunny beans tempered with the coolness how they ever wrestle with their own sweet delight and ever nestle their silver bellies on the pebbly sand if you but scantily hold out the hand that very instant not one will remain but turn your eye and they are there again the ripples seem right glad to reach those cresses and cool themselves among the emerald tresses the why they cool themselves they freshness give and moisture that the bowery green may live so keeping up an interchange of favours like good men in the truth of their behaviours sometimes goldfinches one by one will drop from low-hung branches little space they stop but sip and twitter and their feathers sleek then off at once as in a wanton freak or perhaps to show their black and golden wings pausing upon their yellow flutterings were i in such a place i sure should pray that naught less sweet might call my thoughts away than the softer rustle of a maiden's gown fanning away the dandelions down than the light music of her nimble toes patting against the sorrel as she goes how she would start and blush thus to be caught playing in all her innocence of thought oh let me lead her gently o'er the brook watch her half smiling lips and a downward look oh let me for one moment touch her wrist let me one moment to her breathing list and as she leaves me may she often turn her fair eyes looking through her locks a burn what next a tuft of evening primroses o'er which the mind may hover till it dozes o'er which it well might take a pleasant sleep but that tis ever started by the leap of the buds into ripe flowers or by the flitting of divers moths that hay their rest are quitting or by the moon lifting her silver rim above a cloud and with a gradual swim coming into the blue with all her light o maker of sweet poets dear delight of this fair world and all its gentle livers spangler of the clouds hail of the crystal rivers mingler with the leaves and dew and tumbling streams closer of lovely eyes to lovely dreams lover of loneliness and wandering of upcast eye and tender pondering thee must i praise above all other glories that smile us on to tell delightful stories for what has made the sage or poets write but the fair paradise of nature's light in the calm grandeur of a sober line we see the waving of the mountain pine and when a tale is a beautiful estate we feel the safety of a hawthorn glade when it is moving on luxurious wings the soul is lost in pleasant smotherings fair dewy roses brush against our faces and the flowering laurels spring from diamond vases overhead we see the jasmine and the sweet briar and the bloomy grapes laughing from green attire while at our feet the voice of a crystal bubbles charms us at once away from all our troubles so that we feel uplifted from the world walking upon the white clouds wreathed and curled so felt he who first told how psyche went 
on the smooth wind to realms of a wonderment what psyche felt and love when their full lips first touched what amorous and fondling nips they gave each other's cheeks with all their sighs and how they kissed each other's tremulous eyes the silver lamp the ravishment the wonder the darkness loneliness the fearful thunder their woes gone by and both to heaven upflown to bow far gratitude before jove's throne so did he feel who pulled the boughs aside that we might look into a forest wide to catch a glimpse of a fawns and a dryadis coming with the softest rustle through the trees and the garlands woven of the flowers wild and sweet upheld on ivory wrists or sporting feet telling us how fair trembling syrinx fled arcadian pan with such a fearful dread poor nymph poor pan how did he weep to find naught but a lovely sighing over the wind along the reedy stream a half heard strain full of sweet desolation balmy pain what first inspired a bard of old to sing narcissus pining o'er the untainted spring in some delicious ramble he had found a little space with the boughs all woven round and in the midst of all a clearer pool than air reflected in its pleasant cool the blue sky here and there serenely peeping through tenderly wreaths fantastically creeping and on the bank a lonely flower he spied a meek and forlorn flower with a note of pride drooping its beauty over the watery clearness to woo its own sad image into nearness deaf to light as zephyrus it would not move but still would seem to droop to pine to love so while the poet stood in this sweet spot some fainter gleamings o'er his fancy shot nor was it long ere he had told the tale of a young narcissus and sad echo's pale where had he been from whose warm head out flew that sweetest of all songs that ever knew that hay refreshing pure deliciousness coming ever to bless the wanderer by moonlight to him bringing shapes from the invisible world unearthly singing from out the middle air from flowery nests and from the pillowy silkness that rests full in the speculation of the stars ah surely he had burst our mortal bars into some wondrous region he had gone to search for thee divine endymion he was a poet sure a lover too who stood on latimus top what a time there blew soft breezes from the myrtle vale below and brought in faintness a solemn sweet and slow a hymn from dion's temple while upswelling the incense went to her own starry dwelling but though her face was clear as infant's eyes though she stood smiling o'er the sacrifice the poet wept at her so piteous fate wept that such beauty should be desolate so in finer wrath some golden sounds he won and gave meek cynthia her endymion queen of the wide air thou most lovely queen of all the brightness that mine eyes have seen as thou exceedest all things in thy shine so every tale does this sweet tale of thine o oh, for three words of honey that i might tell but one wonder of thy bridal night where distant ships do seem to show their keels phoebus the while delayed his mighty wheels and turned to smile upon thy bashful eyes ere he his unseen pomp would solemnize the evening weather was so bright and clear that men of health were of unusual cheer stepping like a homer 
at the trumpet's call or young Apollo on the pedestal, and lovely women were as fair and warm as Venus looking sideways in alarm. The breezes were ethereal and pure, and crept through half-closed lattices to cure the languid sick. It cooled their fevered sleep, and soothed them into slumbers full and deep. Soon they awoke clear-eyed, nor burnt with the thirsting, nor with the hot fingers, nor with the temples bursting, and springing up, they met the wondering sight of their dear friends, nigh foolish with delight, who feel their arms and breasts and kiss and stare, and on their placid foreheads parted the hair. Young men and maidens at each other gazed, with the hands held back, and motionless, amazed to see the brightness in each other's eyes. And so they stood, filled with the sweet surprise, until their tongues were loosed in poesy. Therefore no love did of anguish die. But the soft numbers, in that moment spoken, made silken ties that never may be broken. Cynthia, I cannot tell the greater blisses that follow divine, and thy dear shepherd's kisses. Was there a poet born? But now no more. My wandering spirit must no further soar. End of a poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mandalay by Rudyard Kipling Read for LibriVox.org by John Nixon, The Supercargo of www.thesupercargo.com By the old Mormain pagoda, looking lazy at the sea, there's a Burma girl a-sittin' and I know she thinks of me. For the wind is in the palm trees and the temple bells they say, Come you back, you British soldier, Come you back to Mandalay, come you back to Mandalay, where the old flotilla lay. Can't you hear their paddles chunking from Rangoon to Mandalay? On the road to Mandalay, where the flying fishes play, and the dawn comes up like thunder out of China across the bay. Her petticoat was yellow, and her little cap was green, and her name was Supi Yorlat, just the same as Thebor's queen. And I seed her first a smoking of a whacking white cheroot, and wasting Christian kisses on an heathen idol's foot. Blooming idol made of mud, what they called the great gourd bud. Plucky lot she cared for idols when I kissed her where she stood. On the road to Mandalay, where the flying fishes play, and the dawn comes up like thunder out of China across the bay. When the mist was on the rice fields, and the sun was dropping slow, She'd get her little banjo and she'd sing coo la With her arm upon my shoulder and her cheek again my cheek, we used to watch the steamers and the affies piling teak. Elephants a piling teak in the sludgy, squadgy creek where the silence hung that heavy you was half afraid to speak. On the road to Mandalay where the flying fishes play and the dawn comes up like thunder out of China across the bay. But that's all shoved behind me, long ago and far away, and there ain't no buses running from the bank to Mandalay. And I'm learning here in London what the ten-year soldier tells. If you've heard the Easter calling, you won't never read nor else. No, you won't need nothing else but them spicy garlic smells, and the sunshine in the palm trees, and the tinkly temple bells on the road to Mandalay, where the flying fishes play, and the dawn comes up like thunder out of China across the bay. I am sick of wasting leather on these gritty paving stones, and the blasted English drizzle Wakes the fever in my bones, though I walks with fifty housemaids out of Chelsea to the Strand, and they talks a lot of loving, but what do they understand? Beefy face and grubby hand, Lord, what do they understand? I've a neater, sweeter maiden in a cleaner, greener land on the road to Mandalay, where the flying fishes play, and the dawn comes up like thunder out of China across the bay. 
Ship me somewhere's east of Suez, where the best is like the worst, where there ain't no Ten Commandments and a man can raise a thirst. For the temple bells are calling, and it's there that I would be, by the old Mulmain pagoda looking lazy at the sea. On the road to Mandalay, where the old flotilla lay with our sick beneath the awnings when we went to Mandalay. On the road to Mandalay, where the flying fishes play, and the dawn comes up like thunder out of China across the bay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Master of Music by Henry Van Dyke. Read for LibriVox.org by Carol Stripley. Master of Music. In memory of Theodore Thomas, 1905. Glory of architect, glory of painter, and sculptor, and bard, Living for ever in temple and picture and statue and song, look how the world with the lights that they lit is illumined and starred. Brief was the flame of their life, but the lamps of their art burn long. Where is the master of music, and how has he vanished away? Where is the work that he wrought with his wonderful art in the air? Gone. It is gone like the glow on the cloud at the close of the day. The master has finished his work, and the glory of music is where? Once, at the wave of his wand, all the billows of musical sound followed his will, as the sea was ruled by the prophet of old. Now that his hand is relaxed and his rod has dropped to the ground, Silent and dark are the shores where the marvellous harmonies rolled. Nay, but not silent the hearts that were filled by that life-giving sea. Deeper and purer forever the tides of their being will roll. Grateful and joyful, O Master, because they have listened to thee. The glory of music endures in the depths of the human soul. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode by Arthur O'Shaughnessy. Read for LibriVox.org by Carol Stripling. We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams, wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams, world losers and world forsakers on whom the pale moon gleams. Yet we are the movers and shakers of the world for ever, it seems. With wonderful deathless ditties we build up the world's great cities, and out of a fabulous story we fashion an empire's glory. One man with a dream at pleasure shall go forth and conquer a crown, and three with a new song's measure can trample a kingdom down. We, in the ages lying in the buried past of the earth, built Nineveh with our sighing, and Babel itself in our mirth, and o'erthrew them with prophesying to the old of the new world's worth. For each age is a dream that is dying, or one that is coming to birth. A breath of our inspiration is the life of each generation, a wondrous thing of our dreaming, unearthly, impossible seeming, the soldier, the king, and the peasant are working together in one, till our dream shall become their present, and their work in the world be done. They had no vision amazing of the goodly house they are raising. They had no divine foreshowing of the land to which they are going. But on one man's soul it hath broken, a light that doth not depart, and his look or a word he hath spoken wrought flame in another man's heart. And therefore to-day is thrilling with a past day's late fulfilling, and the multitudes are enlisted in the faith 
that their fathers resisted, and, scorning the dream of tomorrow, are bringing to pass as they may, in the world, for its joy or its sorrow, the dream that was scorned yesterday. But we, with our dreaming and singing, ceaseless and sorrowless we, the glory about us clinging of the glorious futures we see, our souls with high music ringing, O oh men, it must ever be that we dwell in our dreaming and singing, a little apart from ye, for we are afar with the dawning and the suns that are not yet high, and out of the infinite morning intrepid you hear us cry, how, spite of your human scorning, once more God's future draws nigh, and already goes forth the warning that ye of the past must die. Great hail, we cry to the corners from the dazzling unknown shore. Bring us hither your sun and your summers, and renew our world as of yore. You shall teach us your songs new numbers, and things that we dreamed not before, yea, in spite of a dreamer who slumbers and a singer who sings no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Rebel by Patrick Henry Pierce. Read for LibriVox.org by Daily Bab. I am come of the seed of the people, the people that sorrow, who have had no treasure but hope, no riches laid up but a memory of an ancient glory. My mother bore me in bondage, in bondage my mother was born. I am of the blood of serfs, the children with whom I have played, the men and women with whom I have eaten, have had masters over them, have been under the lash of masters, and though gentle, have served churls. The hands that have touched mine, the dear hands whose touch is familiar to me, have worn shameful manacles, have been bitten at the wrist by manacles, have grown hard with the manacles and the task work of strangers. I am flesh of the flesh of these lowly, I am bone of their bone, I that have never submitted, I that have a soul greater than the souls of my people's masters, I that have a vision and prophecy, and the gift of fiery speech, I that have spoken with God on the top of his holy hill, and because I am of the people, I understand the people. I am sorrowful with their sorrow. I am hungry with their desire. My heart is heavy with the grief of mothers. My eyes have been wet with the tears of children. I have yearned with old wistful men and laughed and cursed with young men. Their shame is my shame and I have reddened for it, reddened for that they have gone in want while others have been full, redden for that they have walked in fear of lawyers and their jailers, with their writs of summons and their handcuffs, mean men and cruel. I could have borne stripes on my body rather than this shame of my people, and now I speak, being full of vision. I speak to my people, and I speak in my people's name to the masters of my people. I say to my people that they are holy, that they are august despite their chains, and that they are greater than those that hold them, and stronger and purer, and that they have but need of courage, and to call on the name of their God, God the unforgetting, the dear God who loves the people for whom he died naked, suffering shame. And I say to my people's masters, beware, beware of this thing that is coming. Beware of the risen people who shall take what ye would not give. Did ye think to conquer the people, or that the law is stronger than life, and than men's desires to be free? 
we will try it out with you, ye that have harried and held, ye that have bullied and bribed, tyrants, hypocrites, liars. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sacrifice of Iphigenia by Aeschylus Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman Now long and long from wintry strymon blew The weary, hungry, anchor-straining blasts The winds that wandering seamen dearly rue Nor spared the cables worn and groaning mass And lingering on in indolent delay, slow wasted all the strength of Greece away. But when the shrill-voiced prophet gan proclaim that remedy more dismal and more dread than the drear weather blackening overhead, and spoke in Artemis's most awful name, the sons of Atreus, mid their armed peers, their sceptres dashed to earth, and each broke out in tears. And thus the elder king began to say, Dire doom, to disobey the gods' commands! More dire, my child, mine house's pride to slay, Dabbling in virgin blood a father's hands. Alas, alas! Which way to fly? As base deserter quit the host? The pride and strength of our great league all lost? Should I the storm-appeasing right deny, Will not their wrathfulest wrath rage up and swell? Exact the virgin's blood? O oh, would twere o'er and well! So neath necessity's stern yoke he passed, and his lost soul with impious impulse veering, surrendered to the accursed unholy blast, warped to the dire extreme of human daring. The frenzy of affliction still maddens dire counsellor, man's soul to ill. So he endured to be the priest, in that child-slaughtering rite unblessed, the first full offering of that host in fatal war for a bad woman lost. The prayers, the mute appeal to her hard sire, her youth, her virgin beauty, not heeded they, the chiefs for war on fire. So to the ministers of that dire duty, first having prayed, the father gave the sign, like some soft kid to lift her to the shrine. There lay she prone, her graceful garments round her throne, but first her beauteous mouth around their violent bonds they wound. With their rude inarticulate might, lest her dread curse the fatal house should smite. But she her saffron robe to earth let fall, the shaft of pity from her eye Transpierced that awful priesthood one and all. Lovely as in a picture stood she by, As she would speak. Thus at her father's feast, The virgin mid the reveling guests, Was wont with her chaste voice to supplicate For her dear father an auspicious fate. I saw no more. To speak more is not mine. Not unfulfilled was Calca's lore divine. Eternal justice still will bring wisdom out of suffering. So to the fond desire farewell, the inevitable future to foretell. Tis but our woe to antedate. Joint knit with joint expands the full-formed fate. Yet at the end of these dark days may prospering wheel return at length. Thus in his spirit prays he of the Apian land, the sole remaining strength. End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. Song by John Donne Read for LibriVox.org by Jack Lim Go and catch a falling star, Get with child a mandrake root, Tell me where all the past years are, Or who cleft the devil's foot, Teach me to hear mermaids singing, Or to keep off envy stinging, And find what wind serves to advance an honest mind. If thou beest born to strange sights, Things invisible to see, Ride ten thousand days and nights, Till age snow-white hairs on thee. Thou, when thou return'st, wilt tell me All strange wonders that befell thee, And swear, nowhere, lives a woman true and fair. If thou find'st one, let me know, Such a pilgrimage were sweet, Yet do not, I would not go, Though at next door we might meet. Though were she true when you met her, And last till you write your letter, Yet she will be. False, ere I come, two or three. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 61 by Michael Drayton. Read for LibriVox.org by Kalinda. Since there's no help, come. Let us kiss and part. Nay, I have done, you get no more of me, And I am glad, yea, glad with all my heart, That thus so cleanly I myself can free. Shake hands forever, cancel all our vows, And when we meet at any time again, Be it not seen in either of our brows That we one jot of former love retain. Now at the last gasp of love's latest breath, when his pulse failing, passion speechless lies, When faith is kneeling by his bed of death, And innocence is closing up his eyes. Now, if thou wouldst, when all have given him over, From death to life, thou mightest him yet recover. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 14 by Elizabeth Barrett Browning Read for LibriVox.org by Neera Janagarajan If thou must love me, let it be for naught, except for love's sake only. Do not say, I love her for her smile, her look, her way of speaking gently, for a trick of thought that falls in well with mine. And certes brought a sense of pleasant ease on such a day. For these things in themselves, beloved, may be changed, or change for thee. And love, so wrought, may be unwrought so. Neither love me for thine own dear pities wiping my cheeks dry. A creature might forget to weep, who bore thy comfort long, and lose thy love thereby. But love me for love's sake, that evermore thou mayst love on to love's eternity. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To His Forsaken Mistress by Sir Robert Ayton. Read for LibriVox.org by David Barnes. I do confess thou art smooth and fair, And I might have gone near to love thee, Had I not found the slightest prayer That lip could move, had power to move thee. But I can let thee now alone, As worthy to be loved by none. I do confess thou art sweet, Yet find thee such an unthrift of thy sweets, Thy favours are but like the wind, Which kisseth everything it meets, And since thou canst with more than one, Thou art worthy to be kissed by none. The morning rose that untouched stands, Armed with her briars, how sweet she smells, But plucked and strained through ruder hands, Her sweets no longer with her dwells, but scent and beauty both are gone, 
and leaves fall from her one by one. Such fate ere long will thee be tied, when thou hast handled been a while, with sear flowers to be thrown aside, and I shall sigh when some will smile to see thy love to every one hath brought thee to be loved by none. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To Two Bereaved by Thomas Ashe Read for LibriVox.org by David Barnes You must be sad, for though it is to heaven, Tis hard to yield a little girl of seven. Alas, for me, tis hard my grief to rule, who only met her as she went to school, who never heard the little lips so sweet say even good morning, though our eyes would meet as whose would fain be friends. How must you sigh, sick for your loss, when even so sad am I, who never clasped the small hands any day? Fair flowers thrive around the little grave, I pray. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Travelled Man by Ella Wheeler Wilcox Read for LibriVox.org by Kalinda Sometimes I wish the railroads all were torn out, the ships all sunk among the coral strands, I am so very weary, yea, so worn out, with tales of those who visit foreign lands. When asked to dine, to meet these traveled people, my soup seems brewed from cemetery bones. The fish grows cold on some cathedral steeple. I miss two courses while I stare at thrones. I'm forced to leave my salad quite untasted, some musty, moldy temple to explore. The ices, fruit, and coffee all are wasted while into realms of ancient art I soar. I'd rather take my chance of life and reason if in a den of roaring lions hurled than for a single year, I, for one season, to dwell with folks who'd traveled round the world. So patronizing are they, so oppressive with pity for the ones who stay at home. So mighty is their knowledge, so aggressive, I oft times wish they had not ceased to roam. They loathe the new, they quite detest the present, they revel in a pre-Columbian morn, just dare to say America is pleasant and die beneath the glances of their scorn. They are increasing at a rate alarming, go where I will, the traveled man is there. And now I think that rustic, wholly charming, who has not strayed beyond his meadows fair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. You Reason's Words of Wisdom From the Four Zoas by William Blake Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Campbell In Appleton, Wisconsin in 2009 And you reason read in his book of brass in sounding tones. Listen, O daughters, to my voice. Listen to the words of wisdom. Compel the poor to live upon a crust of bread by soft, mild arts. So shall you govern over all. Let moral duty tune your tongue, but be your hearts harder than the nether millstone to bring the shadow of Anatharmon beneath our wondrous tree, that loath may evaporate like smoke and be no more. Draw down Enitharmon to the specter of Erthona, and let him have dominion over Los, the terrible shade. Smile when they frown, frown when they smile. And when a man looks pale with labor and abstinence, say he looks healthy and happy. And when his children sicken, let them die. There are enough born, even too many and our earth will soon be overrun without these arts. 
if you would make the poor live with temper with pomp give every crust of bread you give with gracious cunning magnify small gifts reduce the man to want a gift and then give with pomp say he smiles if you hear him sigh if pale say he is ruddy preach temperance say he is overgorged and drowns his wit in strong drink though you know that bread and water are all he can afford flatter his wife pity his children till we can reduce all to our will as spaniels are taught with art end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Way Through the Woods by Rudyard Kipling Read for LibriVox.org by Ruth Golding They shut the road through the woods seventy years ago. Weather and rain have undone it again, and now you would never know there was once a road through the woods before they planted the trees. It is underneath the coppice and heath and the thin anemones. Only the keeper sees that where the ring-dove broods and the badgers roll at ease, there was once a road through the woods. Yet if you enter the woods of a summer evening late, when the night air cools on the trout-ringed pools where the otter whistles his mate, they fear not men in the woods because they see so few. You will hear the beat of a horse's feet, and the swish of a skirt in the dew, steadily cantering through the misty solitudes, as though they perfectly knew the old lost road through the woods. But there is no road through the woods. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A White Rose by John Boyle O'Reilly Read for LibriVox.org by Nina Janagarajan On the 14th of February, 2009 The red rose whispers of passion And the white rose breathes of love Oh, the red rose is a falcon And the white rose is a dove But I send you a cream-white rosebud with a flush on its petal tips for the love that is purest and sweetest has a kiss of desire on the lips end of poem this recording is in the public domain winter by robert southey read for librivox.org by ruth golding a wrinkled, crabbed man they picture thee, old winter, With a rugged beard, as grey as the long moss upon the apple tree, Blue-lipped, an ice-drop at thy sharp blue nose, Close muffled up, and on thy dreary way Plodding alone through sleet and drifting snows. They should have drawn thee by the high-heaped hearth, old winter, Seated in thy great armed chair, Watching the children at their Christmas mirth, Or circled by them as thy lips declare some merry jest, Or tale of murder dire, or troubled spirit that disturbs the night, Pausing at times to rouse the mouldering fire, Or taste the old October, brown and bright. End of poem this recording is in the public domain.